Breaking Darn Part 2 is really good. Twilight is a character from My Little Pony Friendship It's Magic. Twilight is a prequel to Batman 2022. You know what you are? Say it out loud. Say it. I'm vengeance. As if you could outrun me! As if you could fight me off. Twilight is a really good album to which the movie was a companion piece. I, I don't like these movies. Well, I've seen them, and I've read the books couple times? I don't think they're very good, but like many people in my generation, I've grown to find them very compelling. Compelling is a useful word when evaluating something as elusive as quality in art. Does it move you in any direction? Did something happen or did it leave you stagnant? No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. Does it have an intended effect? Does it have an unintended effect that's also valuable? Does it do both at the same time while doing neither? It's bad and it's good and it's great and it sucks and it's funny but it's not and I like it but I don't. I never get the impulse to watch Twilight, but whenever I do, there is much to discuss. I don't come to this series for the craft. I don't come to it to feel things. I come to it to go what? Australian man, an alleged tram driver, Mason from the Mr. Sunday Movies comic book movie review channel, Mr. Sunday Movies, said it most eloquently. They're bad, but there's a lot of stuff in them. <laughs> there's a lot there? of stuff in them. There's not a lot of plot necessarily, but there's a lot of things where you go. <laughs> Over time, for its particularities and idiosyncrasies, Twilight has cultivated a nostalgic cult fandom as well as corresponding retroactive criticism. The final film, Breaking Dawn Part 2, has two major complaints. One, the final fight is fake. <laughs> What the? <laughs> Two, Jacob and Prince on a baby. Be anything she needs. Oh no. Oh yes. Riding an adult man falling in love with a baby, not cool. He imprints on a baby. Jacob imprinted on a baby. But I had a bout of poor mental health lately and instead of seeking help, I rewatched all these movies with a little bit of drool coming out of my mouth and when Breaking Dawn Part 2 came on, I was like, I cannot stress how much a baby was fallen in love with. This is a pretty good movie that carefully emphasizes the strengths of the original text and there was a lot of thought put into that final battle that everyone decried and subtle choices that enhance minor characters. And imprinting would be really cool if it wasn't the way it was and was a different way instead. Part one, fake fight, fake fight, fake fight. In Breaking Dawn, Bella and Edward have a baby named Ratatouille and this causes two very large problems. These two problems come from two parties who both hate the baby, the werewolves and the Volturi, two groups with very different fashion senses. The Volturi are the oldest and strongest vampire clan in the world, globally enforcing vampire law, the most relevant of which most of the time being that vampires must kill inconspicuously as to not accrue the attention and ire of humanity. They're pretentious, weird Italians who maintain a secret society of knowledge, death, and cook a dumb meatball. Another law of the Volturis is don't make a vampire kid. Don't bite a kid and turn them immortal. Kids are, are they, don't, they don't have rights. We shouldn't give them bloodlust and immortality. Bella and Edward's baby Rasputin is not one of these immortal children. She was not bitten as a child. She is a very rare natural born vampire human hybrid, but this bitch doesn't know that. You just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. The entire final film revolves around this impending potential violence as the Volturi very slowly come to slaughter the Cullens for their alleged crime. In response, the Cullen family calls in a bunch of favors for people to stand near them and testify as to the baby's babiness and not vampire-ness. They rapidly and suddenly introduce a dozen new characters, including Rami Malek and Lee Pace, two people that I want to take me on a date. First, I better finish my meal. Help me! Help! Do that to me. The theory is the Volturi aren't gonna ask questions upon arrival. They're gonna see the baby and immediately brute force slaughter her and everyone who gets in the way. They like killing babies. They're not afraid to do it. Unless there was formidable opposition to give them pause who can then attest to the baby's babiness and, and not and not 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 vampireness. That's basically what plays out in the book. There's a bunch of invisible conflict, there's a tense political debate, evidence is presented, and then everyone goes home. Cause the book isn't about violence. It's a kinky Christian sex power fantasy where everyone's obsessed with Bella for no reason and everyone's dangerous, but they love her so much that she is safe. Hurt me, but make me feel safe at the same time. The world building and conflict exists because the whole book can't just be Bella and Edward looking at each other going, Mm. But in a movie, fifth in a franchise, blockbuster finale, you can't just have everyone look at each other and then walk away, that is unsatisfying. So they choose, as they rarely do in these very faithful films, to veer sharply away from the source material. <laughs> Carlisle dies, Jasper dies, everyone's dying, it's Mortal Kombat up in this bitch. But it was all a dream. Boo! No! We don't like when it's fake, it don't matter, you trick me. The complaint here is they tried to have their cake and eat it too. They deviate from the source material to simulate a cinematic climax, but then they pull the rug out from underneath you and reveal it was a conflict with no stakes. Well, you can have that opinion, but also no. The fake fight is a stroke of adaptive genius, taking loose threads from the novel and weaving them together into a new satisfying conclusion appropriate to the medium. And it all starts with Arrow's relationship with Alice. This is all about Alice. Alice. 
The Volturi, contrary to what they claim, are not pillars of immovable justice governing over vampire kind for the collective well-being. They're violent, corrupt dictators that enlist superpowered vampires in an elitist collection and amassing of nuclear power who feel increasingly threatened by the loyalty and talent that the Cullens are amassing. I read Arrow's mind. He wants me and Alice to join him. Breaking Dawn Part 2 is a lot like Dune, except it isn't. And Alice Cullen is another person that I want to date. Hi, Bella. Bella. It's time, it's time, it's time. <laughs> Guys. Mommy. All vampires have super strength and super senses, all, all of all of the supers, but some of them, when turned into vampires, develop special talents. Alice's talent, besides making me attracted to women with short haircuts for the rest of my life, is subjective precognition, visions of the future based on trajectories of people's current decisions. Alice doesn't see unchangeable, inevitable moments in a fixed timeline, but the results of current trajectories. An individual's current intentions and decisions come to fruition. When decisions and conditions change, Alice's visions also change. This tells us, in this universe, the future is not an area of the time-space continuum that we simply can't perceive as linear cognitive beings, but is an unfixed and malleable soup until it lapses the threshold of the present and becomes the past. So free will canonically exists in this universe. We can put that debate to rest. The final fight of Breaking Dawn Part 2 takes place within one of Alice's visions of the potential future. Then when Arrow sees this conflict ending with his death, he decides to leave the Cullens for now to save himself and provides our happy ending. But it's not that simple. Alice's vision of the battle is a little more real than you might think. Part two, psychic feedback loops. Just like in Miraculous, Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir, the most interesting thing about the magic system in this universe is when the powers interact with each other. The first obvious example of this is between Alice and Edward. Edward's power allows him to read people's minds. Alice's visions of the future take place in her mind. So effectively, when Edward is around Alice, he just has her power. Poor Jasper has to put her down with crayons, like write down what, you, what you're seeing so, so I can see Edward's just like, word? Edward's mind reading power goes crazy all over the place when you start to think about it. One of the Cullen allies that is called to their aid is Zafrina, who has the power to make anyone see anything she wants them to. She can just launch you into a hallucination with a thought. I can do that to cats when I'm high. It comes in handy when the Cullens have to restrain the Denali sisters after they're trying to gain vengeance for their sister getting summarily executed in front of them. Zafrina blinds them, making any effort to persist futile. Can my sight back? Kind of like when you cover the head of a chicken and it just stops moving because I can't. Do have any of you guys owned chickens? I have a rich tapestry of a backstory. So say Zafrina does this to Edward, which she kind of does earlier. Can Edward still see? Wouldn't he have the sight of everyone around him? Does he have panoptic vision? Like when you die in Call of Duty and you flip through everyone's eyes in spectator mode? I can read every mind in this room. Then the most unhinged thing is when Edward is interacting with Arrow. Arrow can also read minds, but differently. He has to touch you, but upon physical contact, he downloads your entire brain and all your memories. Arrow can read every thought I've ever had. So when Arrow touches Edward, he can see all of Edward's memories. And Edward can see precisely what Arrow is experiencing. So he is also experiencing Arrow experiencing all of Edward, which means Arrow can see Edward seeing Arrow, see Edward seeing Arrow, see Edward, who is seeing Arrow seeing Edward ad infinitum. Every time these two touch, it just goes Brr! Something of similar paradoxical tone is occurring in this final fake fight as Alice's vision is being experienced by Arrow. Alice claims to have proof that Ramses II is no threat to vampire kind, and this is true. So she must presume when Arrow touches her hand and knows the truth beyond a shadow of a doubt, her vision of the future will change. The conditions necessitating conflict are now been altered and so she will see something else. So when he takes her hand and her vision of the bloodbath doesn't change, she realizes that he's dead set on killing them regardless to eliminate their growing influence and to acquire Alice's powers for the Volturi. He knows we'll never choose him as long as our family's still alive. It doesn't matter what I show you. You still won't change your decision. The only update to the vision is the part where Alice realizes she couldn't have prevented it, which is the final battle we see in the movie, the altered vision as a result of her vision not changing, which Arrow then also sees. That on its own I think is so weird and interesting that I care about the final fight, but also the filmmakers put a, such a strange amount of detail and passion into what they decide occurs in the fight. Part three, Carlisle Cullen. <laughs> I heard the chief's daughter was here. Daddy, I'm sorry, I need to be put down. When Alice's vision of the future doesn't change upon Arrow fully understanding the situation, first, she signals to Bella to instigate their contingency plan for the baby's survival. Jacob will run away with Ravenclaw with documents that allow them to go into hiding indefinitely. Then second, she up smashes the dictator of her political world into the sun. This is the moment Fan hits the fuck. The Volturi sees Alice and start to drag her away. Carlisle, her very hot father, runs to her defense. He's really hot. So in control of his bloodlust that he's a doctor and he's always in control and I, I want him to be in control of me. How do you do it? Years and years of practice. Daddy, can we get a Carlisle fan cam real quick? Jealous. Jealous. Oh, she can have such a lust. Like you don't care. 
Anyways, he dies. Carlisle's death is entirely unacceptable. He is the a priori good man in this series. Carlisle and his vampire coven of Cullen children are vegetarian vampires who survive off of animal blood exclusively so that they don't have to kill any humans. And other cannibalistic vampires think this is weird and unnatural, but despite their feelings about his appetite and ideology, they still respect him enough to come to his aid with the Volturi. And then the werewolves are literally genetically compelled to purge vampires in defense of humanity, but Carlisle single-handedly earns their trust over the course of the series. At first, the werewolves don't trust the Cullens enough to even be around them in their human form. They don't trust us enough to be in their human form. They came. That's what matters. But by the end of Eclipse, Jacob gets some bones broken and Carlisle leaps to his aid as a doctor and is quickly tacitly invited deep into werewolf territory to treat him in the chaos. The Afterwards, Jacob's father ends up shaking his hand in a quiet, momentous, transcultural act of unity. The relationship between these two factions is so emboldened by their uniting to fight against a common threat that the next movie, the werewolves, are attending a vampire wedding. They invited one. You just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. When the Cullens initially settled in this werewolf territory, they established a truce under a, a treaty with several clauses, the primary one of which being that they don't go on each other's lands and that if a vampire bites a person instead of an animal, it's game over, it's hunting season. <laughs> They start expanding this truce when they go on each other's territory, and then when Jacob's having a hissy fit and fantasizing about being able to finally kill Edward as soon as he bites Bella and turns into a vampire, the breach of a treaty is inevitable, but the wolf pack leader goes, I don't care. At least I'll get one thing out of it. No, you won't. Collins are not a danger to the town or the tribe. And the treaty says. I say. Fuck the treaty. I'm the one who enforces it. We're not supposed to go on each other's land either. You were just at our fucking wedding. This guy saved your life a movie ago, and Bella's been horny to become a vampire since 2008. Blind enforcement of the Vampire Wolf Treaty results in unproductive scenarios anyways, like the failed pursuit of an invasive murderous species in Eclipse. Victoria keeps trying to press into their territories to kill Bella because she's obsessed with Bella because everyone's obsessed with Bella in this universe. Victoria? She evades the vampires and the wolves by dancing over their territory line. Wait, she's in their territory. The the two factions have a common goal here, a common enemy, identical purpose, and yet when Emmett overextends himself and breaches the werewolf territory, they let their true enemy go so they can enforce the treaty. <laughs> This is a beautiful demonstration of how contracts can be deleterious to utilitarian purpose. Arrow's ultimate insult that finally provokes bloodshed is to kill the man that proved vampires can be vegans and dogs are our friends. Carlisle was patently the best of them and now Arrow's holding his head like a freshly plucked turnip and smiling like I did when Lee Pace got electric shocked and made this passably post-coital face. I'm saving that for later. Part four, the Twilight movies elevate the text of Jane. Jane of the Volturi Guard is my favorite character in Twilight and not just because I want her to do pain on me. Pain. Do that to me? When her character is introduced in New Moon, we immediately grasp the severity of her reputation with some very efficient silent storytelling. Arrow wants to speak with you again. You wouldn't want to make a scene. Not if Arrow sent me to see what was taking so long. Just do what she says. Her mere presence ends discourse. She doesn't even bother having a conversation. She just walks the fuck away. We go on to see she's a lapdog of the Volturi. Deeply feared, but seemingly disinterested. Kind of bored. The first time she emotes is when she's commanded to test Bella's immunity to vampire powers for fun and science. Let us see if she is immune to all our powers. Whatever horror was implied by the skittish behavior of those around her, this is the payoff of it. Her bad thing that makes everyone so tense. Edward frantically leaps in the line of fire and we get to see what this is. Stop! Stop. Jane can just set all the nerves of your body on fire. Props to Rob Pat for going full ugly in this scene. Although Jane is now torturing the wrong person and accomplishing nothing, she doesn't seem to give a shit. Please stop. Like a violent little dog let off its leash, she's just happy to have her teeth out. When reined in by Arrow, it's like she's waking up to an alarm clock from a good dream. Then she tries the pain on Bella, and it doesn't work. And Jane is so rattled by that. She keeps trying, getting increasingly uncomfortable until Arrow claps with scientific glee. And at this time, it's like she's jolting awake from a nightmare. <laughs> Here, very economically, with basically no dialogue, we get an expediated examination of this minor character's psyche. Jane is universally feared for her unearned talent, so she moves through the world with the comfort of one never defied. When someone resists her, their fate is sealed. When her name is spoken by her masters, she knows what to do. She has a simple 
pure existence. She takes obvious jubilee in this level of control and certainty in the world around her, which makes Bella's resistance to her extremely unnerving. Jane is woefully ill-equipped for the situation in which she is insufficient. She doesn't understand failure. When she gets her first whiff of it, she panics immediately, deprived of her inherited unearned privilege. Basically, Jane is white. And that's all that happens with her in that movie. The, the movie forgets about her. She's not that important. But with some choice framing and acting decisions, they were able to make a compelling two-part story about a mindless agent of violence forced to confront their own limitations for the first time. Then she's in Eclipse, but it's not conducive to my point, so I'm ignoring it. You don't need to do that. She'll tell you anything you want to know. I know. Until Breaking Dawn Part 2's fake feedback fight when we conclude this tale of hubris and humiliation. During the standoff at Arrow's command to provoke battle, he orders Jane to do pain on Edward again. Pain. Unlike a new moon, this time she has no reason to be expect to be called off. She's content to just torture him until his family is forced to help him. But Bella's threat to Jane's apex status has gotten much worse unbeknownst to her. Bella can now extend her immunity to her friends and family. The film language then tells us she's just literally wantonly throwing her torture around indiscriminately trying to get back that rush of dominance and figure out what's happening. No one's bending and Bella's smiling at her. Bitch! Jane at this point involuntarily lunges at Bella, which is crazy. Jane can't fight. She's never had to. We don't even see her use super speed like every other vampire. She rests on her laurels, indulging in her God-given talent and tortures while letting other people fight for her. Take care of that, Felix. I'd like to go home. <laughs> the only person we've seen her physically kill is a literal toddler. This involuntary physical lurch towards their object of frustration is a very childish tantrum at the expanding doubt in her hitherto unquestioned authority. Then when the fight begins, she's an emotional whiplash, entirely reliant on the binary one zero yes no answer of can I torture people when she tries to torture someone and Bella's protecting them. Ah! Then Bella gets tackled by Dimitri and she can torture Jasper and he dies and she's happy. Then Jasper's brother kills Jane's brother in retaliation. Ah! Mom, can, can you pick me up? I'm scared. It never occurred to her that that could happen. Then she tortures a little puppy and has his neck snapped and she's happy again. <laughs> then Dimitri gets decapitated by Edward. Ah! She looks like a nine-year-old getting bullied. Then Alice, the surviving lover of the recently deceased Jasper, is making eye contact with her with clear intent to murder. No problem, put the pain on her. The pain isn't working. Bella's shielding her. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Run away. Shit, I don't run as fast as anyone out here. I got noodle legs. I've never had to do anything before. Fuck. In a glorious release of interspecies harmony, Alice drags Jane by the scruff of the neck to a savage bear attack death at the hands of the pack leader, avenging his youngest pup. <laughs> Jesus. Good old bear attack death. Jane's downfall and her disbelief in it as it occurs encapsulates the larger thematic conflict between the Cullen clan and the Volturi. The Volturi as an institution act out of a sense of inherited entitlement. While feigning to be enforcing law and protection of values or society, they actually act out of the belief that they're inherently better than other people and their power is self-justifying. It's a metaphor for the government. Dismantle political structures, put our politicians in oculus rifts and simulate that they're constantly winning elections so they are always uh, uh, just touching themselves and they leave us alone. Except AOC and Kanye West. I want to see what happens. Then we'll replace fire hydrants with gas tanks, but not tell anybody. Part five, domino death. Look, I could change the lights now. Isn't that fun? How do I undo? <laughs> <laughs> Lightly put, the callous exploitation of relationships backfires on the Volturi. First, they kill Irina Denali in front of her sisters to try to provoke attack. Then Jane tortures Edward to try to provoke attack. Then Arrow kills Carlisle to provoke attack, and that one works and we get Edward's Dragon Ball Z punch. <laughs> what the Volturi don't expect, as best exemplified by Jane, is that the Cullens' close bonds with each other is more powerful than hereditary pseudo-royal Italian talent and prestige. Alec, Felix, and Jane kill Jasper, and Jasper's lover and two of his brothers kill all of them right back. Chaos kills Irina, and then and Irina's sisters kill Chaos with the help of Lee Pace because Lee Pace and Kate Denali start fucking in the background of this movie, which is great. If we live through this, I'll follow you anywhere, woman. Now you tell me. Jane kills the werewolf cub, and then the werewolf alpha kills Jane. Go away, Leah. I can take care of myself. <laughs> And Marcus, the oldest and most bored of the Volturi, Let's be done with this. beats his death at the hands of two Transylvanians that he sabotaged long ago. We've been waiting 1,500 years. But in another poetic adaptive flair, the filmmakers choose to make Marcus graciously accept his death? Finally. This guy has like two lines in the series, but I see a lifetime in his death. And of course, in the most dramatic and fleshed out character arc in the series, Leah saves Esme's life after refusing her sandwich. No! 
touching. The fight finally ends with Edward and Bella avenging their father, and when Arrow snaps out of the vision back into reality, the crowd is too busy booing because the fight was fake to notice that he's evaluating the chain of events backwards, realizing the relationships resulted in his demise. Jacob and Rihanna, the escapees. Arrow sandwiched between Edward and Bella. Vladimir and Stefan who end Old Man Marcus. The Denali sisters with Lee Pace avenging the death of Irene by ripping chaos off by the cheeks, Jesus Christ. Jane idly glancing at the wolf pack, her confidence still intact. Rosalie and Emmett staring down Alec and Dimitri who are still holding an alive Jasper captive. Then Arrow's revelation is complete when he at last looks at Carlisle. He sees the time knife. I saw the time knife? The chain of relationship and revenge that ricochets across this battlefield starting with Carlisle Cullen and ending in the collapse of the Volturi. So we get the cathartic fight all of those satisfying conclusions to arcs and relationships, and then Arrow has this carefully constructed moment of clarity, and then faithfully to the novel, the Volturi just fuck off back to the Vatican. In one last flourish of adaptation that's not in the book, Arrow takes the time to turn his attention from Alice to Bella. Such a pride. Bella, as an object of Edward and Jacob's obsession, was indirectly the instigator of this massive web of intimate relationships, transcending biological and cultural essentialism, knitting together a rainbow coalition that can overthrow the government. Arrow looks at that and is like, Fuck the fortune teller, I want the plot armor. Part six, Jacob and Prince on a baby. And so he does. Okay, so for this movie, Breaking Dawn Part Two is an individual installment. I'm trying to save Jacob from this one joke. So should I start calling you dad? This joke, all in its lonesome, confirms imprinting as divinely mandated grooming, and without it, the movie almost gets away with a more wholesome interpretation. The concept of imprinting is introduced in Eclipse, and in the initial descriptor of it, it doesn't specify that it's romantic, but it also very clearly is. <laughs> in real life, imprinting is when a young creature identifies an external agent as a parent or a major source of reliability and trust. And imprinting means I accept you as mum. Okay, so Jacob thinks the baby is his mommy? Stephanie Meyer co-ops this real life phenomenon into a mystical occurrence where werewolves were once in their lives, see a woman, and just become slavishly committed to them forever. So Sam dumps Leah for Emily? It's more than some crush, Bella. Sam imprinted on Emily. Okay, so then Jacob thinks that the baby is his wife in training. That's it's worse. The insurmountable problem that this story runs into is that imprinting was obviously concocted as a psychosexual fantasy, and then later they want to treat it as a world-building element that can solve a conflict. Yes, the initial description of imprinting is not explicitly romantic. It is at its heart, theoretically, just the supernatural chaining of your existence to another. When you see her, everything changes. All of a sudden, it's not gravity holding you to the planet. It's her. But it's constantly mentioned one sentence away from romance. The first example we see of it in this universe is the pack leader, Sam, who tragically left a happy relationship with Leah to be with the wolfy imprint subject, Emily. Sam hates himself for hurting Leah, but Emily was the one. And then Jacob rambles about how he wishes he imprinted on Bella because then she would love him back. And he tries and he tries and he's getting cucked. So it's telling us like imprinting isn't naturally psychosexual. It just happens to be all the time. But it can't be by its own internal logic. This notion that a wolf that imprints on a girl will be the perfect partner for the girl, it, it has two glaring assumptions. One, the assumption that the object of the imprinting would want to date the wolf back. And two, that the wolf would want to date the imprintee. They say the object of imprinting, whoa. They say that the object of imprinting certainly could reject the wolf, but the conclusion that they come to is although a woman may initially reject her wolf or initially not have feelings for them, it's also unlikely to last because the wolf will be their perfect partner either by cosmic determination or the wolf will change themselves to be exactly what the girl needs. Ladies, raise your hand if you've ever known a boy who was always there for you at all times and is thinking about you constantly and his well-being is 100% contingent on yours and is willing to alter themselves for your benefit so that you like them more. That is not a good mate. That is cloying and very unsexy. Trust me, I know, men really like me. If a werewolf is genuinely chained in loyalty and programmed by God to want the best for the object of their imprinting forever, wouldn't the werewolf be vigorously supportive of any relationship that the girl wants? Surely, by merit of its perfection, imprinting is, at its core, unromantic and asexual and rooted over everything else in primal loyalty. And when you're looking at the text, it's like it wants you to think that, but the emphasis overrides the content. In the book, at one point, Jacob drives off to another town and is sitting at a park, creepily staring at pretty women, trying to imprint on somebody that isn't Bella to save him from his heartbreak. And then two chapters later, he imprints on a baby. 
requires mental gymnastics not to associate these events with each other. Then in this movie, there's this unhinged scene where these imprinted couples are crawling all over each other on one part of the beach while the incel, unimprinted cocks sit twiddling their thumbs on the virgin side. This is not how people in relationships behave in public, just lying in a mushy pile of parallel play PDA. 20 meaty soulmate couples, and then they just pan to- Some people are just lucky, I guess. I'm Chris Hansen, and I'm a reporter for Dateline NBC. What do you want me to make of you showing these things back to back, except for that grown man is going to take the girl to the PDA pile when she's 18? It is impossible to accept these two thoughts simultaneously, that the relationship's gonna be mentoral and perfectly wholesome until a tipping point when the woman reaches maturity. You're just like, no, no, it's magic, and it, he's perfect for her. It'll be fine. I don't feel fine. Call me old-fashioned. I don't think that you should befriend or take responsibility for children that you suspect on any level you might want as a lover one day. And if it is actually a romantic sexual fantasy thing, that don't let them imprint on babies! Twilight wants it both ways and the consequences are dire. They want us to fully accept this guardian angel wholesome interpretation while simultaneously constantly emphasizing the romance and letting Jacob say this horrible joke. Did I start calling you dad? Part seven, improving imprinting. In Spike Jones's Her, released in 2013, a line of sentient operating systems are developed and sold to the consumers of a futuristic world. The OSs develop emotionally and intellectually at a rapid rate, a rate that eventually outpaces human consciousness and at the end, the computers collectively transcend into godhood. Despite the ultra-fast sci-fi development, it is unavoidable that our main character is dating a person he bought can literally turn on and off, and is technically under a year old. In both her and Twilight, there are moments where the text criticizes the potentially inappropriate nature of a relationship. You're dating your computer? You imprinted on my daughter? But conceptually and ethically, I think that Twilight could take one note from her that would make imprinting much more palatable and more compelling. I was reading an article the other day that romantic relationships with OSs are statistically rare. Thing can happen. It's just statistically rare. With the inclusion of this caveat and the exclusion of this joke. Should I start calling you dad? I'm Chris Hansen. I'm actually pretty down for the supernatural beast being divinely damned to unbreakable fealty to a child. It's like anime. And it retains all of the best and most interesting parts about imprinting. Sam can still be the first one introduced with it. It makes sense that he imprinted on somebody else and his relationship tragically fell apart and then they happen to be a great couple. Y you can have that one. And it also retains and reinforces the suitably creative and satisfying resolution to breaking Don Juan's conflict. The truce between werewolves and vampires that has been built up for a few movies, it faces the possibility of being extinguished eternally as Bella is pregnant with a half vampire child and the werewolves are revolted by this concept. It's unnatural! Dangerous! Monstrosity! So they want to take abortion to the next level. <laughs> Never mind. If something I says upset you, don't comment. Just come kill me. We must destroy it before it's born. You mean kill Bella? Jacob is so convicted about this that he breaks the wolf pack psychic bond and becomes an alpha with his big boy voice. I will not! Jacob will not, and he becomes his own alpha because his great grandfather was an alpha and the alpha leads the wolf pack with his dick. Jacob's defection from the pack delays the wolf attack for a time until Bella dies in childbirth, childbirth? Bella dies in childbirth and Ronald Reagan is born. Jacob, gutted by Bella's death, decides to kill Rum Tum Tugger himself until he makes eye contact with her and instead of biting her head off, he develops the most intense protective bond that anyone in this universe can have. So before the wolf vampire battle can go too far, Jacob leaps out, wolfs up, opens his consciousness back up to Sam and ends it. In the book, it's made clear that when Jacob defects from the pack and becomes his own alpha, his psychic connection to the rest of the wolves is severed. Normally when they're in wolf form, they all feel each other's feelings and read each other's thoughts, but he finally experiences quiet. Thereafter, it's discovered that the alphas between different packs can communicate with each other, but less empathically and more informationally, willingly for practical purposes. But Breaking Dawn, the movie, excludes this information and never elaborates on the two-pack dynamic, so what it looks like to me here is Jacob going wolf, rejoining the pack, which would mean opening his consciousness and flooding all of them with his newfound love for Reggie Gigas. Killing anyone a wolf has imprinted upon is strictly forbidden because of the incalculable, immeasurable pain it will cause the wolf, and by extension, everyone in his pack mind. If you read this as Jacob psychically rejoining the pack, he's simultaneously offering his subordinates while trapping them in an inability to kill the person they were just about to kill. This half-human, half-vampire child is also now strictly under the protection of the werewolves. She's the nexus of unity between the factions. Jacob imprinted. They can't hurt her. It's their moment. Most absolute law. This is kind of fucking epic. Part eight, but come on, is he gonna date the baby? Well, the book is unfortunately very comfortable asserting, yeah. You're the only one we could ever trust her with. I murmured to him. If you didn't love her so much, I could never bear this. I know you can protect her, Jacob. He whined again and dipped his head to butt it against my shoulder. I know. I love you too, Jake. You'll always be my best man. A tear the size of a baseball rolled into the russet fur beneath his eye. 
Edward leaned his head against the same shoulder where he'd placed Ren, Renez, Renez, me, Ren, Renezne. Goodbye, Jacob. My brother. My son. Woo! Happily ever after, everyone gets a soulmate, but at what cost? I understand the novel's justification for it, and I will report it, but this is not me. One, wolf imprinting is so wholesome and perfect, he couldn't possibly think of rhinoplasty that way until it was the perfect time for everyone. And until then, he's the perfect friend and guardian. Quill imprinted with a two-year-old? It happens, Jacob shrugged. He bent to grab another rock and sent it flying out into the bay. Or so the stories say. But she's a baby. He looked at me with dark amusement. Quill's not getting any older, he reminded me, a bit of acid in his tone. He'll just have to be patient for a few decades. I don't know what to say. I was trying my hardest not to be critical, but in truth, I was horrified. Until now, nothing about the werewolves had bothered me since the day I'd found out that they weren't committing the murders I suspected them of. You're making judgments, he accused. I can see it on your face. Sorry, but it sounds really creepy. And number two, the book spends a lot more time emphasizing Rumpelstiltskin's unnervingly adult cognizance from birth as she whips towards physical maturation at four times the rate of a human. So Jacob's like 18, and by this logic, Rin Tin Tin will be older than him in six years. I remind you, this is the book's justification. It's not mine. The movie spends way less time than the book on everyone being constantly unnerved by your uncanny maturity, but they do give her the one really cool moment with Arrow. Wait, I wanna talk about that. Part, part, another part. Before Roblox learns to talk, she can already intelligently communicate with her vampire power, which is the inverse of Arrow's. By touching someone's face, she can force them to experience her memories and feelings. I thought it was really cool in the book that as a baby, if she wanted to contribute to a conversation, she would touch the face of the person holding her and just replay the last second from her perspective, either to impart her thoughts and feelings about it or ask an implicit question. It's also with this power that the Cullens are able to convince their allies that she's not an immortal child and she requires advocacy. Inevitably, in the final standoff, Rip Van Winkle is brought directly before Arrow. I'd like to meet her. Arrow is polite. He's subtle with his domination of other people. He maintains this veneer of magnanimous diplomacy and kindness, but he subtly subjugates people when he warmly invites them to take his hand in greeting. It's never brought up, but with this simple ritual, he is exerting complete control over other people. He's smiling nicely while he's doing it, but he's still invading their minds and depriving them of privacy and visually and psychologically recreating a kind of kissing of the ring. But when he meets Robitussin and offers her his hand, she ignores him and reaches up and touches his face, forcing him to contend with her existence on her terms. This also happens in the book, but in the book, Arrow has no reaction because he's used to experiencing someone else's emotions and feelings and thoughts and memories. But the movie, again, puts its little faithful with a flair adaptive sauce on it, showing him debased by this symbolic disruption to his ritual. It's just another little moment in the book that is given a little extra juice by the film adaptation. So, speaking of things the movie does better, does Breaking Dawn Part 2, the movie, think that Jacob's gonna date the baby? I argue no, except this fucking joke. Should I start calling you dad? As soon as Roller Skates is born and Jacob imprints upon her, the movie retreats at breakneck pace towards any plausible deniability they might have. They still take the time to bloodlet the instinctual revulsion and skepticism that the audience would have about this through Bella discovering that Jacob imprinted on the baby to great comedic effect. <laughs> But mercifully, they then exclude the book's constant insinuations that Jacob will be Bella's son-in-law or the months it takes for Bella and Edward to be comfortable with Jacob and her daughter's relationship. They just beeline it to Jacob being like, it's not what you think, Edward can read my mind. If it was what you think, then would he, he wouldn't let me live. She's a baby! It's not like that. You think Edward would let me live if it was? All I want is for that car. to be safe. Happy. It's not about that. It's not about that. It's not what you think. It's not about that. And it doesn't mean what you think, Bella. They play the disgust as a misunderstanding, acknowledge it, and then move on with the guardian angel interpretation. And you know what? I can get down with that. That's a good adaptive choice, thank you. Alice's happily ever after vision of the main characters at the end also pulls a punch, leaving just enough space for a charitable interpretation. Rico Nasty just has her head on Jacob's shoulder and that's it. No kiss, no wedding, nothing. This is vague enough to satisfy the weird Twilight fans who need them to get together while not explicitly ruling out the guardian angel interpretation. Or it would if it weren't for this joke. Did I start calling you dad? Jacob mentioning that he's thinking about this even for a second is unforgivable. This self-aware snark is not worth it. They already got the greatest possible self referential wink nudge doubting skepticism joke about it at the start of the movie. You nicknamed my daughter after the Loch Ness Monster? How the fuck are you gonna top that? Why is Kristen Stewart the most unconvincing mother ever put to film? Look, a snowflake. It's beautiful. We're all gonna be together now. You're not my dad! Be good art, stop! Stop!
Stop that beat, Why am I even talking about this? Why didn't I just talk about the final fight and join the chorus of imprinting condemnation? Is this hill worth dying on, CG, you piece of shit? Vampire Lee Pace decides who he kills and eats based on their bad art. Shut up. I need him to touch me! I think I'm an addict, want the world and I'm a habit. I'm so fucking dramatic, got all my bones up in the attic and I dance them all around like a marionette. So in the first installment, Edward meets Bella, that's the inciting incident because of two phenomena that are happening simultaneously. The first one, obviously, the relevant one that actually triggers four books worth of plot is that her blood, for some unknown reason, is particularly delicious smelling to Edward. To the point it's like his personal heroin. It's such a problem, he can resist everyone else's human blood smell, but not Bella's. Something about her blood is particularly irresistible to Edward specifically, and not necessarily everybody, even though Alice confirms that her blood does smell pretty fucking good, but th th that's one thing. And then the second thing, it's a, it's, a, it's a simultaneous phenomena where Edward can read everyone's mind as his vampire talent, but he can't read Bella. So, okay, okay, I can surmise that these two phenomena are actually emergent phenomena stemming from one actual underlying cause, which I presume to be the biological makeup of Bella and how that interacts with Edward and how his powers work. Okay, so it's just a massive coincidence. These two people met each other and it's resulting in this interaction. I can understand that, and it, and it makes sense, and it doesn't require investigation or explanation until, until they bring Bella before the Volturi in New Moon, and then suddenly, Jane's powers don't work against Bella. Fucking Aro's powers don't work against Bella. No one's vampire powers work against Bella. She just can resist them all, which doesn't make any fucking sense. Why does she have superpowers? Why does it work like this? I can understand it being an interaction between two agents, but I can't understand, like, Bella as a human, just like having this superpower, she can just resist the magic of otherworldly beings that are of a higher existence than her. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking, because you're thinking about the fact that when a human turns to a vampire, their natural kind of human abilities get transformed into supernatural abilities. They get exaggerated, which is why Bella's resistance to Edward's mind reading develops into a shield against uh, all vampire powers that she can extend even to other people when she turns to a vampire. But you're thinking about fucking Siobhan. You're thinking about fucking Jasper. Like these people had like these natural innate human abilities that you could understand in the human context. Like, like Jasper could like sense people's feelings generally, you know, he, he, was, he was an empath. Or like Siobhan, she could like plan really well. And then when you become a vampire, this turns into you can actually literally sense or influence people's emotions, or you can actually visualize and manifest future reality. So okay, you, you understand the difference there, where you have a human ability that is understandable in a human context, turn it into a supernatural ability, as opposed to Bella, who just has a supernatural ability? Why does one person in this universe actually have a supernatural ability? It makes no fucking sense. And also, it's not even fucking true because Jasper can influence Bella's emotions and Alice can see Bella's future. So she's not even immune to vampire powers. No, I didn't know it was your birthday, Mom. Are you even fucking listening to me?